One of the challenges of our era is that technology and our information consumption habits are changing so rapidly, but we don't yet understand what they're doing to us. O Brasil conversa agora com Alexis Wichowski. Ela é PhD em Ciência da Informação e professora na Universidade de Columbia em Nova York. Alexis, thank you very much again. It's a pleasure to have you at Um Brasil for the second time. Mm -hmm. We are going to talk about something very trendy, right? The post-truth, which Oxford Dictionaries designated as its 2016 Word of the Year. So I guess we have three types of viewer right now. Those who know what it means, the group of people who don't, and also those who think they know, but are not sure. So let's start with the basics. What is it? So post-truth, as you uh, mentioned, was chosen as the 2016 word of the year, very cleverly by the Oxford English Dictionary, I think to reflect what they were seeing happening in the public, which is that people were ignoring facts and reality in favor of opinion or uh, their own perspective on what happened. So post-truth is not, uh, it, it's, I think the phenomenon is more a uh, reaction against people wanting to have control over the kind of information that they were consuming. Um, but in, in truth, it's really just another way of saying that people don't want to face reality. They don't want to face the facts. So they've declared this phenomenon post-truth as a way to ignore facts. I think that people have always done this to a certain extent, ignored uh, evidence that they didn't feel comfortable with. But most recently, it's become acceptable almost to do this. Is it because of the internet? <laughs> I think it's in part because of the internet. I think the internet has allowed the post-truth phenomenon to become popular uh, because of how quickly news spreads. Pe as I said, people have always denied the existence of certain evidence that they're uncomfortable with or don't want to face. But I think that there's, it's easier to find others like you. It's easier to seek out the, uh, the truth that is convenient for you online because there's just so much information out there. So you can find a group of like-minded people who are all uh, accepting the same sense of reality and band together and ignore the rest. Whereas in 20 years ago, when there were only three television stations, it was much more difficult to do that. And this phenomenon is very good for politicians, right? <laughs> it's very convenient for politicians. Uh, I think it's very poor for our democracies, but I think that it makes it easier for politicians to get away with lying. Because the reality is that that's uh, what's happening, is that people are accepting uh, lies as sort of a normal part of the political discourse in a way that wasn't acceptable even just five years ago. Um, oddly enough, the internet makes it harder than ever to um, hide evidence, because you can always find it somewhere, somehow. But it has also made it possible for there to be these alternative narratives that you can buy into. So, As I said, five years ago, if a politician was caught lying, they would apologize, they would say they misspoke. Nobody ever uses the word lie. Uh, but now it seems that there's almost an embrace of post-truth. There's an embrace of this fact that not only are uh, politicians having their own versions of events, they're proud of it, and they declare themselves uh, almost above the truth. Like, it doesn't touch them, it doesn't affect them. Well, in Brazil, we have, for instance, Agência Lupa, It is the first fact-checking agency in the country. Lupa means magnifier, by mm -hmm. the way. So, for example, when a politician says he hasn't made money while in public office, the journalists of this agency investigate and verify his statement, exposing that his revenue has actually risen over 300% in the previous four years. So, does that show the importance of a not-so-fast journalism or a good journalism above all? I think that good journalism is more important than it's ever been. I think there's something very ephemeral about the news cycle these days, where a story comes out, everyone gets an excitement over it, and then it passes very quickly. But good investigative journalism that accumulates facts and evidence, that doesn't go away. And the more of that accumulation of evidence that we have, the easier it will be to combat people who are promoting lies or denying the truth. So 
I think that there, I just can't say enough that journalists, fact checkers, investigative reporters, they have a stronger role to play than ever before. Um, I think that politicians who are riding this wave of acceptance of uh, post-truth, acceptance of lies, essentially, they're, they're kind of like shadows. You know, they cast this big appearance and they seem really larger than life. Um, but I think they are ephemeral ultimately and they're not going to last. I think the public will eventually grow tired of not knowing what's reality and having people try to pull the wool over their eyes or direct them to some sort of alternative narrative. I think eventually, I, and this is, I'm an optimist, I admit, um, but I do think that eventually that people will recognize evidence for what it is. And so journalists have to keep working hard. They have to keep doing their work. Since his campaign, Donald Trump, wages a uh, war on the press, offering us the term alternative facts. What do you think about this? It's just another way to say, I'm lying. There's no other way to put it. That's all it is. And it's one of the most, I remember being so um, aghast when I heard the word alternative facts first used uh, in public in a serious, non-ironic way, because the, de the very definition of the word fact is something that is tr real something that is true based in evidence. Um, there is no alternative to a fact, is, a fact is a fact. It's an absurdity. Um, I remember thinking I was reading maybe a parody um, article, not an actual news article, but um, it's just another way to spin this idea that facts don't matter and that anything that the administration wants to say, it can say and get away with. And I, again, I hope that journalists don't let that happen. One of your previous experiences include leading a team at Harmony Institute where you conduct a research about the impact of media production on individuals and society. Mm -hmm. Based on your studies, have we become less concerned with the verifiability of what we believe as long as it conforms to our point of view? Yes and no. So I think that we've always wanted to find information that supports what we believe. It's called confirmation bias. It makes us feel better. Uh, nobody enjoys being told that they're wrong or having the experience of finding out that some deeply held belief of yours is in fact based on um, a falsehood. I do think that, as I said earlier, it makes it, the internet makes it easier to seek out information that conforms to your beliefs. Um, but I don't think that it's going to last all of that long. Um, again, there's an appetite now for, I think, uh, actual news that we haven't seen in a long time. One of the only, not only, one of the positive side effects that has come out of the Trump administration's um, uh, election is that people realize that there are real consequences to post-truth. There are real consequences to uh, espousing falsehoods from our, having our political leaders espouse falsehoods. Um, other countries are not trusting us in the way that they used to. Um, it's affected our diplomatic relationships. It's affected um, the perception of America as a stable country. Um, the president of, former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, is the special envoy for climate change at the UN. And after the US pulled out of the Paris Climate Change Accords, she called the US a rogue state because the only other people who are not signatories are Nicaragua and Syria. Mm -hmm. So there are real serious consequences to the United States experience and uh, inside the United States and also our standing in the world. And so I think that people will at some point recognize the value of facts and evidence and truth in reporting. And even if it's uncomfortable, even if it goes against what they believe in, will hopefully at least accept that there's a, a need for that kind of reality in our discourse. Those late night tweets of Donald Trump harms a lot diplomacy in your opinion. I think that having a tweet like the Kofifi tweet uh, where it's not even spelled correctly and nobody knows what the term means and clearly it was just a bad typing. Um, it's become a joke and by extension the presidency has become a joke. The fact that if somebody had said two years ago that the American president would be the laughing stock of the world, I don't think most of us would have believed it. Even people who don't like America I think would not have believed it. But that's kind of where we are right now. And not having any sort of um, intermediary step from the mind of the president to uh, the world through Twitter 
is, I think, dangerous for the country. I think it's bad for the democracy. Okay, so still talking about the habit of consuming news only in social media. It ends up uh, leading people to read only the title or perhaps the first paragraph of a news report and already publish comments on the subject. In this case, people are not necessarily getting wrong information, but this is clearly insufficient for those who want to comment or make a point. Yeah. What do you think about that analysis? I think that it's accurate and I think that it's sort of the information equivalent of gorging yourself on junk food. There's not, I think, a good sense of how potentially damaging it is to just skim a headline and think that you have an understanding of a situation. Um, we're shortchanging ourselves by not giving ourselves the opportunity to think for a moment before we respond or to learn a little bit more before we respond. Now, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, this is the world we're in. Um, unless we all decide to throw away our iPhones and stop looking at news on the internet, we have to figure out how to contend with the fact that we're being flooded with headlines at all times. Now, the click-through rate from a headline to an article is pretty low. It's about 20%, according to um, a survey I read, uh, in two, 20, a survey conducted in 2015 in the U.S. Now, considering that you may be exposed to hundreds and hundreds of headlines a day, clicking through one, to, one, uh, one of every five is actually not so bad. The question is how much of that click-through results in reading an article, really thinking about it, reflecting, digesting, before you make a comment. And that is yet to be seen. One of the challenges of our era is that technology and our information consumption habits are changing so rapidly, but we don't yet understand what they're doing to us exactly. Um, we have a sense of the trends. As you said, people are skimming headlines and taking that to be all the news and uh, making comments very quickly. Uh, but it's not clear that that will always be enough. I suspect in the same way that if you ate nothing but junk food, you would feel pretty bad after a while. Um, st your health would suffer. I feel like when you only skim headlines, when you only consume information rapidly and don't stop to think about what you're doing, eventually you don't feel very well. There's actually a phenomenon social scientists have dubbed Facebook depression because the more time people spend on Facebook almost by the hour, um, the worse they feel about themselves. There's a lot of reasons for it, but just the fact that social scientists are starting to understand that all of this consumption of media may be having ill effects on our health uh, signifies that there's a lot more study to be done. On the other hand, there are people that read all the article, but they are always trying to find a side. They are used to articles with one opinion and they don't like or get a uh, news report with multiple views. Do you think people are always seeking a side? I think that it's very common and I think it's a problem. Um, I think we need to be more disciplined in the way that we consume media. I, I really get the sense that we're kind of like where we were in the 1950s when it comes to nutrition. People just ate whatever they ate and didn't exercise, and that was the way that it went. Um, maybe we had a sense that that wasn't good for us, in the same way that people smoked all over the place, and people thought, ah, oh, smoking, maybe it's not good for us. I'm coughing a lot, maybe that's not good for me. Um, but it hadn't really been studied yet. I feel like we're sort of in the information equivalent of that right now, where people are engaging in information consumption habits, like seeking out news that agrees only with their own opinion, looking for information to be sort of like an ammunition in an argument um, that isn't necessarily good for our thought processes, it's not good for the way that we digest information, and at some point it's going to feel uh, unsatisfying. That's my suspicion. I'm an optimist though, so I can't say that that's what everybody would say in my position, um, but I do think that people have less appetite for balanced perspectives than they seem to have in the past. Um, but the other reality is there's just those options now exist. I think the media itself has a responsibility to continue to put out fair, uh, nuanced reporting that reflects both sides of an argument, even if that's not what people are necessarily asking for. I do think the media has a tremendous amount of power and responsibility, and it's uh, their duty to exercise that. And how can we overcome that? One of the things I always recommend is to is an exercise of looking at Google News or any news aggregator 
that has multiple headlines of the same story. And one of the things that you can do with that is find out just how different uh, the headlines can be about the same exact event. Mm -hmm. Now, the more you do that, the more you look critically and take a pause when you read a headline and you realize, actually, this is just one perspective. So when I read in my news sources, I always go to Google News first and look at the headlines of the day. And for maybe the top 10 headlines, I will click through to look at maybe the 20 other headlines that relate to that one story. Then I will pick which story to read. I very often try to find the most neutral source, like Reuters or the Associated Press. Um, not always. Sometimes I find it very satisfying to just go into my little uh, bubble and, and read what makes me feel good. But I do try to be disciplined about it. And I tell my students, it's like exercise. It may not be easy to do. It may uh, feel a little exhausting while you're doing it. It's work, but it makes you feel better afterwards. So I think it's worth the effort. Since we are talking about Trump diplomacy, on the potentials and dangers of policymaking in the social media area, what should governments be concerned with and focused on? I think that there is, and I say this as a communications professional, as a press secretary, I think there's a need for people in this kind of position. I think we need communication professionals because words matter and words mean something. So to just have our political leaders, our elected officials be able to speak off the cuff whenever they feel uh, moved to do so without thinking of the consequences can be really dangerous. And I'll give you one example. Just today, this afternoon, uh, President Trump tweet tweeted about the fact that five Middle Eastern countries have broken ranks with Qatar. Now, Qatar has a U.S. military base on it, which is very important for the U.S. in its fight against ISIS. Trump bragged that he, his intervention with Saudi Arabia is one of the reasons that these five countries have broken ranks with Qatar. Now, the Pentagon, who is responsible for the military base in Qatar, is scrambling to say, oh, but relations with the U.S. and Qatar are going really well right now because we have a military base there, and if Qatar kicks out the U.S., then it will damage our ability to uh, engage in this fight against ISIS. Did the president think about that when he tweeted? I really don't think so. And I think a communications professional could have said to him, hey, actually, there's a problem. If you just say this, if you try to take credit for this or say that this is a good thing, we might lose our base. We might lose in our ability to fight against terrorism. So I think that governments need to absolutely engage with their citizenry through social media, but they need to do so cautiously and think about the consequences of what they say. Do you think by now people who voted to Trump are rethinking? <laughs> I think that there is a very loyal base that will support him no matter what he does. But I do think that there is a portion of the population who wasn't inspired by Hillary Clinton, who maybe wanted something radically different. They were angry. They felt like they needed something to shake up and change things around. They embraced this sort of outlaw attitude that Trump possessed and this larger than life persona that he possessed um, and thought, well, that sounds like it could be a really good thing for our country and he'll figure out how to be president once he's president. But now we're a few months into the administration the behavior hasn't changed, the tone hasn't changed, and he has actual power to do some real, uh, to take actions that have lasting consequences and to do some damage. So I do think that there are a portion of voters who maybe thought he would change, who might be having second thoughts right now. And also I do think that there are a portion of voters who realize that the policy implications of what Trump is uh, promoting affect their lives. They might lose their health insurance. They might see their jobs disappear. Um, I think that that kind of thing wasn't necessarily discussed deeply in the campaign season. The campaign wasn't about issues. It was about scandal, one scandal after the next. And now the issues are coming home, and people are seeing that they may be affected by it in a really uh, personal way, and it's making some people very nervous. Yeah, he's denying globalization. He's giving China power. So... Big danger. Absolutely. Um, what he's done to the United States on the glo global stage is, again, a few years ago, I wouldn't have believed if you said that the U.S. was being called a rogue state, that the U.S. was considered an unstable entity. Uh, 
Angela Merkel, who's the um, uh, German Prime Minister, said at a meeting with NATO that we're on our own now. You know, we can't count on the United States. We have to decide our own fate. The fact that my country is now considered unstable and unpredictable and uh, not a part of the global democracy is very disconcerting. And do you think the press is being fair with him or should they be more effective against him? I think the press is recognizing the consequences of the way that they covered the campaign. I think during the campaign they gave far too much attention to scandal and didn't hold enough, um, didn't pay enough attention to the issues. And now they're seeing the consequences of that, which is that we have this person in power who doesn't seem to be able to um, take the people of his country into consideration in his decision-making process. I know that the press is uh, polarized, as the society is polarized, as many of our societies are polarized. But I have been encouraged when I see things like the Wall Street Journal has a feature that has news feeds, liberal and conservative, and it shows you kind of snippets of what you would see on a, a Facebook feed if you were a liberal and what you would see on a Facebook feed if you were a conservative side by side. The New York Times now has a special section called What the Other Side Says, and it's picking out articles from conservative news outlets to show to its liberal readers. So I think that the media is trying harder to break down the polarization um, recognizing that damage that it's done to our country. About the polarized world, we are feeling that pretty much right now in Brazil. So I borrowed this from an article I've just read. When it comes to the truth, where you stand depends on where you sit. I'd like you to comment that. So I'm going to respectfully disagree with this quote because the whole idea of truth is that it is based in reality and is based in fact. Your perspective on the truth, that depends on where you sit. Your opinion about the truth, that depends on where you sit. But truth itself has to be something that is based in reality. It has to be something that's based in fact. Otherwise, you might as well call white black and black white. It's, otherwise, it takes truth and makes it an absurdity. So I really feel that while we can have our perspectives and our beliefs and our opinions that change depending on, our pers uh, on where we stand, where we sit, uh, truth itself has to be objective, and it has to be something that all sides recognize and respect. I know that's not necessarily the case right now, but I have to believe that we will all get there someday. Alexis, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>